Good evening, everybody. Uh, I see the attendee number uh, continuing to go up. Uh, so we're gonna wait just a minute and um, give folks uh, just a little bit more time to hop in. We'll be right with you, thank you. All right, I see that a few folks are still trickling in, um, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna go ahead and kick things off. Good evening and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Jim Bass. I am the Coastal Resilience Program Manager here at Eastern Shore Land Conservancy. And I am really, really excited uh, for this workshop this evening. This is workshop number three in our workshop series, uh, Solutions for a Changing Delmarva. Tonight, we're talking all about nature-based solutions and the role that nature plays in protecting our communities from the impacts of climate change. We've got some great speakers uh, lined up this evening. I think that everybody's really gonna enjoy hearing from all four of them. Uh, and we've got some time carved out in the agenda for some good question and answer. Uh, so I hope that we'll have as much engagement this evening with question and answer as we have had previously. Uh, this is a quick snapshot of the agenda. Everyone should have received a copy of the agenda via email earlier this afternoon. Uh, and before we get started, we wanna give a special shout out to the Roush Foundation. Um, they have funded us uh, for this project and that has made this all possible. Uh, we are so, so grateful for the support of the Roush Foundation. Um, without them, uh, we wouldn't be here tonight. Um, so thank you very much. Um, tonight's uh, speakers are Colin O'Mara with National Wildlife Federation, Jessica Granis with National Audubon Society, Katie Spiglieri with the Georgetown Climate Center, and Khalil Kettering uh, with the Nature Conservancy based out of their DC chapter. Um, I'm also joined this evening uh, by ESLC's Coastal Resilience intern, Tyler Chandler. Uh, Tyler is going to um, help us out with some housekeeping stuff and manage the question and answer sessions that we do um, after each of our speakers. Uh, so Tyler, thank you for being with us and everybody will have the opportunity to hear from Tyler here in a little bit. Um, so Colin, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you if you want to turn your camera on. And uh, let me get my other uh, document pulled up real quick and I will, uh, give Colin the proper introduction. Colin, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I am really excited about your presentation. I know everybody else is as well. Uh, so Colin O'Mara is the president and chief executive officer of National Wildlife Federation. Colin serves as president and CEO of National Wildlife Federation, America's largest wildlife conservation organization with 53 state and territorial affiliates and nearly 6 million hunters, anglers, birders, gardeners, hikers, paddlers, and wildlife enthusiasts. Uh, Colin has done great work. He is a native of the state of Delaware. And so we're really excited for Colin's professional expertise as well as his local Delaware perspective. Uh, Colin, thank you so much for being with us. I'll turn it over to you. Great, no, thank you, Jim. And thank you all for being with us tonight. Um, I apologize for this kind of I don't know, hostage style video. I'm hiding from my three-year-old um, who's been blowing through doors as she gets stronger and stronger. Um, but when Jim invited me um, to, to join you all to talk a little bit about natural solutions and natural defenses um, for the peninsula um, and for the and for the bay, um, I, I just couldn't turn it turn it down because, like, I mean, we're in the midst of an absolutely you know kind of historic series of crises. Right, President Biden talks a lot about the intersecting uh, the pandemic, a, a, a an economic crisis with you know, tens of millions of people out out of work. Uh, a racial reckoning that you know we are we are just beginning to scratch the surface of addressing centuries of of injustices and 
and the climate and the climate crisis, and I would add kind of a fifth, the, the biodiversity crisis. And and frankly, there's no better place to show how investments in our natural systems could help bring together um, solutions that actually bolster resilience, of course, but also address these other kind of historic crises that we're facing in strategic ways. Um, I'm guessing that a lot of you kind of turn to natural resources uh, as ways to cope during the, the pandemic. And you know, for me, like that was kind of this both kind of solace and solitude, and um, you know, in some cases, just sanity, um, being able to spend time outdoors, you know, with the family, getting out of the getting out of the house. Um, and obviously, that's a, an experience that not everyone has has access to, and so that's something we also have to work on together. Um, but I think it also reminded folks about the importance of our natural resources. And so we're in a moment right now where. We are likely going to be spending, you know, trillions upon trillions of dollars to try help rebuild our economy. Um, we're likely going to need to find solutions for employment, um, ways to address some of the historical inequities, um, ways to reduce risks of future pandemics, um, and and frankly, a lot of the work we're going to be talking tonight um, isn't just important from a conservation point of view, but it's also significant um, in these in this kind of bigger context. And so I, I'm really excited that the likelihood in the you know probably starting. The, the COVID package will probably take you know, a few more weeks to pass to the Congress, but then the entire attention of the US government is going to shift towards investments in infrastructure. Now, this is a big deal. I'm like in, in DC, for those of you that do work in the, on the Hill, um, infrastructure weeks kind of become a running joke in Washington with you know, President Trump kind of always trotting it out. I think the difference now is that there's an economic necessity towards creating millions of jobs, um, just given the, the sky high unemployment that folks are still facing. There's still a lot of folks that aren't counted as unemployed um, because they are actually, um, they, they're furloughed, maybe they think they're going back or they're kind of good at working part-time. Um, so the unemployment numbers are actually a lot, a lot bigger than we, th when we thought. And at the same time, you know, we see disproportionate impacts on younger Americans, you know, folks under 30 that are you know, facing two and three times the unemployment rates of, of older workers. You know, they're often the last ones in, the first ones out. They tend to work heavily in you know, things like retail and, and, and and hospitality and, and other industries um, that are that have been more hit by the pandemic than than some of the other other sectors. Now, the reason I tell you all that is that kind of in the crisis lies incredible opportunity to, to kind of play on the cliche. Um, if they're going to spend trillions upon trillions of dollars trying to put people to work, what better place, what better way to invest than in the restoration and resilience of our natural resources? There's a potential, I mean, and I think this is something we could all work together on with many of the great partners across the region to bring a billion dollars of investment to the peninsula over the next five years to try to restore our natural resources. A billion dollars. Right now, you know, right now it's about $85 million a year between the 70 million or so for the Bay Program, about 15 million a year for the Delaware. Um, now imagine you know, having you know, 200 million every year in addition to that 90 million uh, 85 million for the next five years. Imagine what we could accomplish. Imagine the properties that we could bolster the resilience of. Imagine the, the natural, car the carbon that we could sequester. Imagine the species that we could bring back. It could be absolutely transformative. And we also know that those types of investments are investments that create more jobs per dollar invested than almost anything else because they tend to be very labor intensive um, and don't have quite as many material costs or other, other, other capital costs compared to you know, a transportation project or an overpass or a bridge. And so it's a way to put a lot of people to work really, really quickly. As a kind of a quick aside, you know, one of my priorities throughout the conversation in the infrastructure context is as we're thinking about investing our natural resources, also making sure that kind of bringing back the Civilian Conservation Corps in a big way um, as a way to address the youth unemployment crisis that I mentioned before, particularly in an equitable way, given how many uh, youth of color and indigenous youth are, are unemployed right now. Um, could be a big big part of the solution and frankly matching the employment needs that we have with the the employment needs that we have that with our that we have with our with our ecological needs that we have is a huge opportunity and so i wanted to talk with all of you today about kind of if we so so let's just envision for a second let's just accept you know kind of the premise that you know there could be 500 million to a billion dollars of investment in the peninsula over the next few years you know, how would we actually want to spend it now now, I've been pretty excited. Jim was briefing me the other day on kind of the Delmarva Oasis idea. Um, and this idea that, you know, trying to bring together, you know, a lot of different visions under a common umbrella and a common ecological platform is something that I think, you know, kind of the time is right to think big. You know, one of the challenges we have on the Delaware side of the peninsula 
is that you know we've never really, until a few years ago, we never really thought about it as one big system. I mean, the Chesapeake Bay programs always had this great organizing principle of the Bay itself, right? A huge destination. A lot of politicians live in the area or vacation there. Um, it had kind of more, a little more um, kind of political rele relevance and salience um, compared to more working waterways. Um, and, I, and I'd argue not just in, you know, not just in the case of the Delaware, but the same thing with Ohio or even further upstream, right? In the, in the, um, in, in you know, the headwaters of the, of the, of the Chesapeake, we have some of these challenges to kind of show the, the connectivity and the relevance. I think what I'm really excited about is kind of building these partnerships at scale. So we're thinking big about what would it take to actually restore resources in a way that simultaneously allow us to meet our, our resilience goals. And we know that natural defenses, I'll talk more about this in a second, but we know natural defenses are both more cost-effective, more enduring um, and more ecologically sound than a lot of gray infrastructure solutions. Um, there was no better example of this in the country than the comparison between you know, us in Delaware and, and folks in New Jersey. And I love our friends in the garden state, but where Delaware had chosen to invest in a lot of dune restorations, wetland restoration in the, in the Bayshore environment, um, a lot of the investments on the, on some of the investments at least on the New Jersey side were more seawalls. Um, the seawalls failed during you know, storms like Hurricane Sandy where the, the wetlands and dunes, even though we lost some sand and you know, lost, a little bit, lost, lost a little bit of soil through erosion, um, those systems held and they defended the systems behind them. So the first one is around resilience. And obviously that's gonna be a big focus of the, the conversation, how do we make communities safer as we're seeing more extreme uh, weather events, as we're seeing more precipitation, as we're seeing greater levels of sea level rise. Um, so how do we bolster resilience? But at the same time, as we're thinking about these natural systems, these natural defenses, there's an opportunity to simultaneously not just achieve our resilience goals, but also achieve our, our bio, biodiversity goals, our water quality goals, um, and a whole range of other, of other kind of societal, societal goods. On the biodiversity side, you know, one thing we've been working at on with many of you through the National Wildlife Federation and, and many of our partners is thinking about these kind of massive living shoreline projects, these massive kind of coastal restoration projects in ways that also create critical habitat for species that are really struggling. You know, Maryland and, and Delaware have two of the best state wildlife action plans in the country. And I, I'll give my friend Matt down in, uh, down in Virginia some credit too. The Virginia wildlife action plan is incredibly good as well. You know, in, the, in this region, we've identified you know, more than a thousand species of greatest conservation need that have habitat needs. A lot of these are um, kind of aquatic or kind of aquatic adjacent, if you will, species that, that need our help. Um, and the, frankly, a lot of the biggest challenges, I mean, there's of course climate impacts, but a lot of the impacts are habitat. Um, it's habitat loss from development. It's, it's, you know, it's in some cases, it's you know, a little bit of sea level rise or, 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 sal or salinity levels kind of shifting in, in, in waterways, more, kind of more brackish waters as, as the, the salt line kind of moves up. But I mean, imagine investing in ways that are simultaneously making community safer and providing habitat for a range of species that, that we need to conserve with the goal of preventing them from, dec from declining to the point where they need protections on their Endangered Species Act. And look, and I'm incredibly proud of the work that this region has done collaboratively on trying to bring back species like the Del Delmarva fox squirrel and you know, the work around red knots. And there's a whole range of species on both sides of the peninsula that we've been able to work together. Um, but there's a whole, whole bunch more critters that are kind of one step away from the emergency room and that ounce of prevention could be worth an, a huge pound of cure. If we can do some really, really smart upstream investments in habitat restoration, there's a, a piece of legislation that I know many of you have been supporting for a few years now called the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Uh, this is an incredibly innovative bill that's been, you know, had great support from folks like Senator Cardin and, and many others. Um, and the idea is, is pretty simple. It's that by investing in habitat restoration and investing in the implementation of the state wildlife action plans, um, that, that we can save species proactively, collaboratively uh, in ways that will hopefully be quicker and more efficient and more cost-effective than waiting to the point within the precipice of kind of disaster and, there, and we need the protections under the Endangered Species Act. So it's just one example. I mean, on the, on the well, same thing on the water quality side, right? I mean, I think, you know, there is no better, you know, framework out there right now for achieving water quality goals than the, the Bay Program. I was proud to you know, be a proxy on the Executive Council when I was a secretary in Delaware. Um, and saw kind of the evolution of that council from a place where you know, we weren't really able to talk about climate change to uh, really kind of making that a, a priority. And we weren't able to talk about you know, certain types of educational programs and some different types of practices and watching that evolution. Um, and I give a lot of folks credit for it. I mean, you know, all kinds of governors played huge roles, incredible staff, incredible partners like the, the Choose Clean Water campaign, um, you know, the, the, the foundation. I mean, there's so many partners that, that play a huge role in that, those conversations. But it is a framework that you know, lets us know how we're doing, right? And as we all, all have seen from the recent numbers, um, we still have a ways to go on, on many different indicators. And so thinking through how a big investment in resilience and infrastructure could help achieve our water quality goals 
is yet another opportunity that, that is, at, is at hand. And you know, obviously a lot of the challenges we're facing now are more on the, on the non-point source side. Um, you know, obviously a lot of challenges upstream, uh, you know, particularly in, in, in Pennsylvania and even in Delaware and in some cases, West Virginia um, and other headwater states. But again, thinking through how you know, investments that meet these kind of multiple objectives at the same time can be deployed in ways that are, are really optimizing across as many different variables as, as possible. Um, it's not more technical than it, than it, than it should have. But I, again, I, I, see, I see massive opportunities in the weeks and months ahead. On, on the Delaware side, you know, the, the Delaware the River Basin, um, the Delaware River Basin uh, Conservation Act that was passed a few years ago that creates this 15 million, now it's up to $15 million program. It's more of a val voluntary collaborative program where we leverage a lot of funds. There isn't kind of a one size, there isn't kind of a universal like TMDL that everything feeds into. A lot of sub uh, tributaries have those kind of programs. But again, huge opportunities for, for restoration, for improving fish passage. Some of the major dams like the Brandywine have been you know, dammed up for a long time. So we're trying to bring back shad runs. But again, a lot of opportunities. And so as you're listening to this call, as you're listening to other experts, as you're just thinking, I mean, I do think that there's an opportunity to try to make the case that we need massive investment because you have more kind of shovel ready projects or projects that are kind of well um, conceptualized in this area, you know, ar arguably than other parts of the country. So I'm excited. Um, I, think, I think this kind of initiative also fits into the, the kind of the Biden, the Biden administration priorities around thinking about restoration and resilience as a centerpiece of their, of their, of their economic goals with employment, of their climate goals with natural climate solutions, like you know, between you know, 20 to 25 percent of the carbon emissions in this country could be sequestered through natural systems, you know, whether that's forests or wetlands or grasslands or kind of marine environments. A um, lot of opportunity there and obviously ways to for you know, the states to meet their ambitious climate goals that they've all adopted. Um, the states, the, the federal government's also talking a lot about 30 by 30. Um, this idea that we should be uh, conserving or restoring 30% of our land by 2030. Um, it's an incredibly ambitious goal. Um, and again, I mean, this is about you know, ecological productivity and trying to show how we can restore uh, systems that have been degraded, whether it's on public land or on private lands, on state land or federal land, um, on working lands. I mean, there's so many opportunities uh, to try to you know, in, in improve the habitat value, habitat that's been bisected, dissected, fragmented you know, all across the country, leading to a lot of the connectivity challenges and the migration challenges that so many species face right now. So for a Delmarva resident, right, for somebody living in, living in the region, like what does 30 by 30 mean? Right? So we got good you know, farmland preservation programs in different places, good forest legacy kind of style programs, um, but we're not, not close to 30% yet that's actually, that has some level of additional, additional protection. And again, I'm not saying that, that you know, places need to be, you know, that we need to reduce um, acreage of, of certain types of activities, but I am saying that we should figure out ways to coexist in smarter ways that having better habitat values, um, better connectivity, you know, making sure that you know, riparian corridors are revegetated, making sure that buffers are, are, appro are appropriate in places where we can you know, reforest in, in smart ways that are ecologically sound, we should do that. But really thinking through across the peninsula, you know, how do we, as, especially, I mean, especially as you know, more and more folks are looking to live in a place that we, they can telework from, there's going to be even more pressure um, on, on the peninsula. You're going to see it on the bay side, of course, um, just given the amazing you know, kind of small towns that folks have up and down the eastern shore. You're going to see it on the, on the Delaware side as more folks are looking at the inland bays and the, and the ocean beaches. You're going to see it on the Virginia side, I mean, through the Maryland side, all the way down to Ocean City, all the way down through the Maryland side, the, uh, down to the Virginia side, uh, as you get down to Chincoteague and Assateague. Um, I do worry about this, right? I mean, on one hand, I love that folks are excited and they view the natural treasures of the Delmarva Peninsula as a number one reason to relocate to this area, combined with really, really low taxes in, in Delaware and you know, really, really high quality of life everywhere. Um, but I also worry about the pressure that's going to put on the resource. You now, we've already seen over the past several years how housing development that wasn't particularly well planned um, and often was kind of put in places that didn't have any kind of septic, or any kind of sewer infrastructure led to a massive infusion of, of nutrients, for example, in the inland bays, where there was just a, a massive number of, of septic systems that came online in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, we've, I mean, we've worked hard to try to connect a lot of those systems, but again, it's just a lot of pollution going into systems that are already pretty nutrient laden, um, making it very hard to meet our water quality goals, leading to algal blooms. And so this is one way to, to kind of think about in a strategic way, having investments kind of protect the best of what we have, um, restore as much as we possibly can. I did see a note just come up about native plants. Um, you know, there's a huge opportunity to make sure that native plants are absolutely central in all restoration activities. So we're bringing back the full diversity of, 
of flora and fauna um, on the on the landscape and the native native plant finder and, and NWF is a great tool for folks to look at what what makes sense in your zip code. But I see an opportunity for a bottom up collaboration. I mean, similar to you know the similar what to all all of you do at ESLC, similar to the you know, Del, Demarva Oasis conversation that's underway, and this idea that bottom up solutions of the places that really make sense to protect, um, the really places that really make sense to restore. And having those decisions being, you know, coming from the ground, coming from, you know, the, from the from the NGO community, from the state agencies, from local partners, um, trying to make sure what really makes sense. So it's not a top-down kind of solution set. It's more of a top-down goal, and then a bottom-up series of solutions to, to meet that goal. Um, it's pretty exciting stuff. So I, I think, you know, it, it's part of that. It's part of that conversation. There's obviously a lot of talk about connectivity and corridors. Most of the conversation so far has been more about you know, elk and mule deer and pronghorn and, and moose and, and bighorn sheep you know, out west. But the connectivity challenges we have in the, on the peninsula are, are real too, right? I mean, in some cases it's you know, terrapin crossings since you know, I'm trying to get across you know, Highway 1 um, in, in Delaware. In some cases it's, you know, it's, it's deer um, where we've you know, encroached upon habitat in ways that have um, just made it hard and basically turned you know, the, uh, the normal deer migration ranges, you know, smaller and smaller to the point where they're in the middle of, you know, neighborhoods all across the, uh, all across the peninsula um, and everything in between. You know, there's a lot of connectivity issues around, around, you know, freshwater mussels and around a whole range of species um, that just need that connectivity um, for, quality, for water quality, for water quality, for also just, you know, I probably shouldn't use them as an example for range. But again, like thinking through connectivity in, at a time when, you know, many folks are looking at a way to, you know, unfortunately, it's you know very economical to turn a you know a working farm into a you know into a housing development, um, particularly with you know a trade war that's making commodity prices um, fluctuate greatly, where markets are opened and closed based on different different kind of postures of the previous administration. Um, that uncertainty is having ecological impacts on on wildlife and on the on the peninsula um, in, in in you know pretty significant ways. And so again, thinking through how all these different moving pieces lead us towards a vision of restoring you know, the absolute best resources on the, the peninsula and really arming us, and arming maybe the wrong word, preparing us, making us more resilient to the future that we know is coming, um, even if we do our best to reduce emissions, is gonna be an absolute imperative. So I, I just think, I think I would just encourage everyone to kind of, that's on this call, and if you're listening to the other, other great speakers that we have, we need to think big. And, and, you know, and I'm happy to talk in detail, you know, kind of till everyone wants to, to go to sleep about the different types of natural defenses and, you know, how, like, kind of thinking about different things on like the shoreline versus like, you know, kind of early successional habitat or thinking about, you know, kind of wetland complexes or, or reforestation in ecologically smart ways. Um, but at the end of the day, a lot of the, the opportunities there are going to be dictated by the amount of money that's flowing. And at a time when state governments are probably going to be a little uneven for a little while, um, and so trying to meet you know other needs, this federal opportunity and the ability to leverage that with all of your resources and all the great work that we do with partners on the ground um, is the most transformative opportunity, because you know as we've seen the last few years, you know the, as these storms become more extreme, you know as we're seeing you know greater precipitation, as we're seeing grain levels of sea level rise, the communities that are making investments in strategic ways at the systems level, um, communities that are really thinking through how they bolster resilience from a range of different kinds of impacts. And that could be everything from, you know, flooding to drought and heat waves, right? I mean, kind of thinking through how we meet the human needs um, is often also kind of the best solution set for the ecological needs. And so I wanna posit to you, in addition to kind of this billion dollar idea that I think I'd love to work with all of you on and try to convince our, our delegation to be really thinking big, um, to have enough on the, Del the Chesapeake side and the Delaware side and for the, all the estuary programs. Um, I also would love to, to have folks really think about how we that you know care about these you know these natural solutions are advanced in a way that is meeting the human needs of the community, right? I mean, we have places that there's so much pavement that the urban heat island effects on the on the peninsula can be 10 degrees higher than the urban areas can be 10 degrees warmer you know on, on hot sunny days than you know places that are in more of a suburban environment um, or more of a rural environment. We have you know high disproportionate levels of of asthma um, in the region. A lot of that comes from cross-state air pollution, you know, that starts in Ohio and Western Pennsylvania and in the old coal plants that, you know, don't have the modern scr scrubbing technology in some cases, um, lead to having pollution that's, you know, kind of coming across Baltimore, coming across, winding up in, in Wilmington, winding up across the peninsula. Um, how we use kind of ecological solutions to make the case to say, hey, 
know, planting trees at scale, building our canopy, restoring, you know, native trees is a way to not only, you know, increase property values and increase, you know, beautification, but it also serves for habitat, right? It also serves as, as ways to improve air quality. It also serves as, way, as a way to reduce surface temperatures um, on, uh, on, in, in, the adjacent, you know, in the adjacent areas. I mean, there, there's so many multiple benefits. And so I would just challenge all of you to be thinking about how do we make the case for the ecological assets that we all believe in because of their intrinsic value, their natural value, their habitat value, and show how they're also solutions to so many other challenges that, that communities face. You know, and, and one of the examples I love to use is native trees, right? A lot of cities have their, their tree goals, which are fantastic, but if we can make sure that those efforts are also native trees, um, that support a much broader range of, of habitat. So like a, a native oak, for example, may support you know, 400 different species of caterpillar, where an invasive or a non-native you know, ginkgo or honey locust you know, may support less than five. Um, you know, by choosing the right trees that serve all these other functions, right? They, they improve water quality, they provide clean air, they provide shade, they provide um, value. Um, but if we also get the right trees in the right places, they provide all this ecological benefit. And so again, thinking through how the needs that our communities are facing, the need to put people to work, the needs to improve folks' health um, can also be achieved through the various solutions that, that we're all talking about. This is really an intersectional moment in our, in our history. I mean, I think you know, folks are realizing that the old systems aren't working, that a lot of the, a lot of the systems that we've kind of depended upon are, are rupturing. There's no better example than what's going on in Texas in the last two weeks, which is absolutely heartbreaking. But you know, just a, a combination of kind of poor decisions for, for decades, um, combined with an unwillingness to have a real conversation about potential impacts um, as things are, as climate is, is really, you know, kind of creating this huge, these huge disruptions, whether it's more extreme hurricanes they've seen in the wind in the, in the summers, or obviously this, this incredible, I don't want to call it a cold snap, almost like a polar vortex um, this past week. You know, we need to be thinking differently. And the, and the regions that do, I mean, the regions that have, uh, you know, that have kind of thoughtful intersectional plans about how to bolster resilience and kind of weather the storm and at the same time deploying, you know, cleaner sources of energy in smart locations, of course, I don't want to see them in, in many places on the peninsula, but there are some places that make sense. Um, really thinking through how we want to make sure we're building towards 2050 and not back to 1950 um, is going to determine which regions thrive for the, in the coming decades. And there is no reason that the Delmarva Peninsula um, is not at the vanguard. I mean, I will, I mean, having traveled to every single state in the, in the I guess, 47 states in the, uh, the 12 months before the pandemic, um, having worked with NGOs in every single corner of this, of this country, um, I will say that the talent, that the passion, that the quality of the NGO community, just the citizenry of, of local governments in many cases is as high in the, in the, on the peninsula as anywhere in the country. And so we have all the pieces, right? I mean, I think there has been a lack of investment. I think there's been uneven progress in some places. You now it's political winds shift or economic tides turn. There's no reason we're not a model. There's no reason we're not the global model for resilience. Um, there's been all kinds of pilot projects that are great. There've been all kinds of work. I mean, I couldn't be more excited about the amazing work of the, uh, the Mid-Atlantic Regional Center of the National Wildlife Federation under Jen Myhill's leadership and before her, Hillary Falk, um, who I have doing national stuff now. Um, just amazing quality work that is going on. And, and, I, and I, could, I could do the same thing for the, the, the Chesapeake Conservancy or the Bay Foundation, or I mean, the number of the Delaware Nature Society, there's just so many groups that are doing amazing work, the National Aquarium. Um, you know, there's so many folks that are doing amazing work on the ground. Um, I still wonder if there are greater opportunities to leverage those individual efforts into a greater whole. Um, I think we were doing a better job on the advocacy side. I'd love to see a, a, even more collaboration on the physical restoration side. Um, you know, the land trust, the conservancies, I mean, there is just amazing work that's going on. Now imagine supercharging that work you now with potentially up to a billion dollars of federal funding to, uh, to try to accelerate it. Um, we could become the national model. And not only is it kind of exciting to do from an academic standpoint, it's also incredibly important from, a, from an ecological standpoint. And I'll end with this story before I, we get to the, the Q&A. The, um, so I was the secretary in Delaware during Hurricane Sandy. And, and you know, we had spent a lot of time the previous few years, much to the chagrin of some of the, uh, the legislators, but we had spent a lot of time the previous few years really thinking about how to leverage resources to try to restore natural systems. And we had great leadership in our, our state parks. We had great leadership in our Division of Fish and Wildlife. We had great, in our, in our, in our, we had great leadership in our shoreline and waterways programs. Um, and they were all united about thinking about how to make basically resources more resilient 
so they could weather, you know, kind of more extreme events. And again, I think we were thinking, you know, slightly further, longer term um, than what we ended up experiencing, which, which is in 2012, you know, kind of what we thought was a hurricane of the century, which is turning out just to be a, a normal year. You know, as, as Hurricane Sandy kind of came, bore up the eastern seaboard and in you know, kind of across the bay and, you know, in, in, in left a trail of devastation, unlike anything we'd seen in this region in, in a long time. And the, the takeaway was that as much as I was proud that the ecological functions held, that the dunes were strong, that the, you know, that the wetlands you know, absorbed the water so it didn't flood out, you know, adjacent communities, that, you know, the, dev the devastation was limited. Um, there, were, there were casualties um, in Delaware, but a fraction of what other communities, other similarly situated communities faced. Um, the number of lives that were saved was, was real. I mean, there were, you know, there were entire communities that if it wasn't for those investments, you know, the, you know, the appropriate use of, you know, dredge spoils to help build up, you know, wetland resilience, the, the use of, uh, you know, clean, clean sediment for, for dunes, uh, the restoration of wetlands, the, uh, you know, trying to kind of deal with the, the, you know, kind of abuse of some of these systems in the past. And again, we, we still had miles and miles to go, but, you know, years of work on, land acquisition and restoration and resilience and you know fixing earthen dams and levees and all those systems, they save lives. And all of a sudden it went from being you know kind of a theoretical contract. So how do we prepare if to now we know that these systems work. And the thought I want to leave you with is that if we're able to win the argument that natural solutions, natural defenses, natural infrastructure is a way to make communities safer is a way to make more people, have more people work, is a way to weather these more extreme events that were coming, then all of a sudden, this isn't an ecological conversation. This is, a, this is basically, it's a public safety conversation, right? It's a, it's a health conversation. It's a, it's a conversation around, you know, protecting property and protecting lives. And, and that's a different place to be in the political spectrum, right? Because then all of a sudden, you're not the last one at the trough saying, hey, if there's a few dollars left over, then let's go do this land conservation deal. It puts you first in, the, uh, first in line, I'm not gonna use the trough again, I guess, but to put you first in line to have a real conversation about how do we protect communities from what we know is coming? And how do we do it in a way that have all these other benefits because we're gonna be coordinated, we're gonna be thinking you know, across all these different disciplines and we're gonna do it in a way that's cost-effective, that's resilient long-term um, and is gonna you know, have all these, additional, all these additional advantages. That's a very different conversation. And that's where I'd love to have all of you, you know, thinking about how we, how we advocate over the next few months at the level and then at the state level after that to make sure that, that, again, we're winning the argument on absolutely every front. This is a, it's a game-changing opportunity. You know, I, mean, I mentioned the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. I could do the same thing, you know, for the amount of money we need for the estuary programs, the same thing I could do for what we need for the state revolving funds, for what we need for the Bay program specifically, what we need specifically for the, the Del River Basin Conservation Program. Um, but it's a huge opportunity. It's a, it's a, I mean, I just don't, I mean, they could end up, end up spending four to five times more just on the infrastructure package, not even mentioning the previ previous COVID packages, than the, than the Recovery Act of 2009 spent in total. I mean, it's a massive amount of investment. And so I think we have to win the day, right? We have to win the argument. These are not like, it's not, this isn't make work. This isn't work that's you know, frivolous. This is stuff that's going to serve the region for a long time. And if we do that, all those plans that we've worked on, all those like charrettes that we put together, all the workshops that we've done, I mean, all of that comes to life because there's a level of funding over like a five-year period to actually make those visions come to life on the ground at scale. That's a transformative opportunity. And frankly, it's the first one in my lifetime where that kind of money has been spent. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I'm a student of, of FDR and the, and the Civilian Conservation Corps and how he and Ickes and Wallace and others, you know, kind of thought through project priorities and kind of thinking through you know, how to get the, uh, how, to, how to both put folks to work and, and solve these bigger challenges. We haven't seen this kind of level of investment. I mean, I mean, arguably in the Great Society, but that was more urban focused, and it wasn't a huge ecological component to it, outside of like land conservation through the early nascent land and water conservation fund. That's a game changer, right? And so I would just encourage each of you to think big, um, think really big, and then get loud, um, and, and 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 get loud with elected officials. Bring in other partners. I mean, there's folks that are doing amazing environmental justice work across the region. We need to make sure that their voices are lifted up, that they're leading, um, that they're, they're, the solutions they've de developed are fully funded. Um, there are huge opportunities to lift up, you know, communities all across the all across the peninsula that have been left behind um, with real resources in ways that are going to make their communities healthier, safer, have more recreational options, um, and create more jobs. It's a game-changing opportunity. So I would love to work on this with all of you. I hope I've maybe inspired at least a little spark of thought about how to uh, 
how to do some of this work. But it's a, um, if we miss this opportunity, I don't know if another one comes. And you know, the cynic in me in, in, in kind of operating the halls of Congress every day is that at some point, the kind of the, the realization about the level of, of deficit and the budget deficit as well as the long-term debt is gonna become debilitating in their ability to, to spend money. Now is not that time. Um, now, I mean, like I'm as fiscally responsible as anybody, but now is a time with low interest rates, high unemployment. You know, if, if Maynard Keyes you know, was alive today, you know, this was the exact time that he was talking about for a kind of direct government investment as a way to you know, stabilize and, and recover economies. The fact that we can do it in a way that prioritizes restoration and resilience with hopefully a billion dollars in the in the on the peninsula and hopefully you know 200 billion dollars of investment across the country um, is a huge 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 opportunity and I look forward to I look forward to seizing it but then making the most of it altogether. Jim, why don't we open up for questions if you want? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Colin, so much for your um, presentation. We'll just jump right into it. So the first question we have is from Steve Pennington. He asks. What grants are available for clean wastewater systems and solutions? Yeah, so I mean, the, the signature program for, for those types of programs are is, is the state the state clean water um, revolving funds. So the, the drink there's a drinking water revolving fund for drinking water products. There's a clean water one for for you know traditional wastewater systems. Um, depending on the state, they're all designed a little differently. Um, but I'm sure we can get you in touch with the the right folks in your state. Um, to talk about those programs. In some cases, they're administered at the state level. In some cases, it's more at the, at the county level. Um, but those are you know, low cost money, um, usually you know, one, two, 3% money to, uh, to invest in projects and you kind of just pay it back over time. And then they roll that into the next project. Um, if, if, if you're in a low income community, sometimes those are more, more structured as grants, um, but those revolving funds are probably the best place to, to start for those conversations. Thank you. Um, the next one we have is from Jim Bogdan. He asks, the National Wildlife Federation's online native plant finder has been tremendously helpful in guiding his landscaping decisions. Is this something that's going to be expanded upon in the future? First of all, I appreciate the promo, Jim. So, so thank you for that. Um, it is a it, it's a it's a great tool, um, and it's one that we have to we have to uh, continue to enhance. I mean, there's some places where it's incredibly robust, other places that it needs work. Um, it was a great collaboration. Uh, with the U.S. Forest Service, and and I just kind of be prouder of the of the work and how much it's used. Um, I think one of the things that we're working on now is trying to make sure that it's, it's connected to a lot of you know decision makers in smart ways as folks are thinking about whether it's you know urban planning or you know state wildlife action plans or different types of even just backyard habitat work um, that you know all the folks that certify their habitats with the National Wildlife Federation, a lot of our partners, and a lot of our affiliates, um, just making sure that those systems are connected because, like you said, like it's a treasure trove of information. Um, so I'd love any feedback. Um, if there's, I don't know if it's in the chat or if there's a way to get it to, to Tyler to get back to me. If there's places where you'd like to see improvement, I'll absolutely share it with the team. Um, we've got some exciting things coming out in the next few months, but we just, I think we're at almost 300,000 um, certified habitats right now through that, you know, kind of that collaboration. So it's, it's exciting stuff, but we'd love to always get feedback on how it can be better and more useful. Yeah, I'll follow up, um, Jim, with my email. If you have more questions, I can always forward them along. Um, all right, next question is from Christine Mosuela. Sorry if I butchered that. <laughs> it's, um, it's a doozy. How do benefit cost analysis compare for something gray versus something green? Um, is it favorable for green solutions? And a follow up, have there been any benefit cost analysis studies that look at the benefits of green solutions to increase the longevity and resilience of gray solutions? Yeah. So that's a fabulous question. Um, and, and frankly, one of my biggest battles when I was in Delaware was that almost every scale, particularly related to Army Corps and other federal investment, tipped the scale towards gray infrastructure. Um, you know, the, 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 the natural, natural infrastructure just did not do well in the solutions. I'll give you a perfect example. So if you build a seawall, um, you know, they basically look at the, the project cost. But if I said, like, I want to I want to restore a dune line or I want to do a living shoreline, um, even though, you know, the, the, maybe the project might cost a little bit more on the, on the front end, the repair is costs are much, much lower. The, um, the beneficial, you know, use the, the kind of the safety value of it is much higher that the, the benefit side of the kind of the cost benefit analysis wasn't really used. It was kind of all assumed to be equal. Um, another example was that if you had a, um, you know, if you, if you were doing a project, uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan. I think, I think we probably dredge in, in some places we shouldn't. But you know, if you have a project where you're, you say you're dredging and putting 
and you have to decide what to do with the spoil. So you see you're dredging you know, the main channel in the case of, of, of Delaware uh, on the Delaware River. For a long time, if it was cheaper to put that fill, regardless of how clean it was, in a landfill versus putting it into a wetland complex where you could use the sediment or onto a beach where it could actually provide a protective value, it would go into the landfill because it was slightly cheaper. Um, even though, it's, but then you'd have a different line, you know, to spend another, you know, X amount of money, you know, tens of millions of dollars to then do a separate project to then restore that beach. Like you weren't looking across different programs. Over the last 10 years, um, and I, I give the National Wildlife Federation a ton of my, 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 my predecessors and, and others um, have really tried to make this a priority in something called the Water Resources Development Act, which is this big kind of authorization of a lot of projects for the Army Corps and other kind of water projects. Um, and, and, and really we've tried to shift this, shift this thinking. And, and, and this, this past December, thanks to some incredible work by, by Tom Carper, the senior senator from Delaware, um, these projects are finally on equal footing. And so you know, they it can actually look at the full cost benefit analysis, the life cycle benefits, um, and it doesn't, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't kind of favor gray infrastructure. And it's funny, the, the big fight we had at the very end of this process was with the cement guys. Um, and they were, they were just raising concern that they might lose a little bit of work. And it was interesting because it was actually Republican senators that said, wait, but if it's a, if it's a fair fiscal test and it's going to be more fair to the taxpayers and it's going to have better protection, like let's just do an apples to apples comparison. And that was the, the final conclusion. So there's a lot more detail behind. I'm happy to bore you to death with the amount of information, but there have been a ton of studies. Um, one of the things that we did very well during Hurricane Sandy was set up a ton of kind of real time and after action monitoring as a way to really look at kind of what the performance was, what the cost effectiveness was. And it turns out that a natural infrastructure project for every dollar that we spend will save six to $10 in avoided damage. So now in, in the federal context, you know, one of the things that I've been making the case that well, if it's gonna save that much money, you should basically you know, not have to figure out how to pay for the dollar. We should be getting credit for the five or six that we're saving. So we're working on that right now. And actually we convinced Speaker Pelosi um, that there's actually language in the house rules this time for, if, for investments that pay for themselves that basically cover their costs because avoid, avoided costs. Um, that they can go forward. And so we're going to kind of give that a test run in this infrastructure package. But you are, your question is so smart because like we have to win the battle, not just on the projects, but we have to convince folks the economics are better because when you have both the economics and the, and the projects on your side, you know, we won't be talking about, you know, project, you know, kind of pilot projects with a few oyster castles here and there. I mean, we could replicate these projects around the entire kind of jewel that is the peninsula. Yeah, thank you. That's really interesting. Um, taking some inspiration from that and from Kelly Fleming, um, question that I sort of have and she alluded to was what tax structures could be used to incentivize creating resiliency projects? Yeah, so I, this is not gonna be a particularly like sexy answer, but you know, one of the best ways to promote investments in resilience is actually flood insurance, the flood insurance program. You know, folks that communities that do better on the resilience and the preventative kind of maintenance side, the, the preventative side actually can get lower rates. And so that program has been, you know, it, it, the program has a lot of problems. Um, you know, maps have been outdated for years. The, the rate structure is kind of in, in some cases in sense development in risky places, but having kind of more accurate maps combined with incentives where folks that are willing to invest that ounce of prevention to avoid the, you know, avoid the catastrophic impacts, having them be rewarded um, is an incredibly important first step. Um, I think well, I think you're going to see more and more on the private insurance side too, um, for folks that you know even just their basic home insurance for folks and setting aside the flood insurance, but you know homes that are more resilient um, are ways to you know it's just, there's just less risk right there's less risk to the insurer there's less risk to the homeowner, and so trying to align those economic incentives are a are a good way to to really really think about how to drive those investments. Now the challenge for all of us then is to make sure that we're investing in kind of natural solutions and not just like hardened solutions right. So like you know making sure that you know. If a town along, you know, say Oxford or St. Michael's or something on the Eastern Shore side, or a, you know, a Bowers Beach or you know, Kids Hummock or something on the Delaware side, or even you know, down down towards the uh, the refuges down you know, Astig and Chickenteague and stuff, I mean, like making sure that you know we're, we really are helping folks have the tools to make those kind of investments in really smart ecological ways is going to be important. I think there are tax benefit potential opportunities too, but you know, as, as, as folks' insurance rates start going up because the risks are greater, greater and greater and folks just can't, I mean, the insurance companies can't afford to have like really low premiums and really high risk areas. I think that's the moment where, and it's happening right now, that's the moment where, you know, you can drive a lot of these investments. And like right now, I mean, more and more property disclosures are disclosing, are they in the floodplain? How, what, what, what kind of what level of risk are they at in the floodplain? I mean, as consumers get more sophisticated, I think they're also going to be driving and calling for 
much greater resilience efforts. I mean, I've seen communities across Delaware um, that are, are basically going to their city council saying, hey, we want a, you know, we want a resilience plan. We want a, you know, a plan to prepare against sea level rise or against hurricanes um, because, you know, they don't want their, 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 um, their, their nest egg to, you know, wash away because, you know, folks didn't take the step to make communities safer. Yeah, that, that actually ties perfectly to the next question I was going to bring up um, from Annie Richards. Um, she asked, when partnering with municipalities to tackle green scrapes, green development, and stormwater retrofits, there are often large buildings, lots, and property holdings that are privately owned and can be huge obstacles in carrying out the bigger vision. What advice do you have for nonprofits trying to bring big business development to the table when working on green solutions with towns and counties? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I am a fan of like stormwater utility type structures where, you know, folks are paying for the the runoff they're contributing, you know, the kind of pollution that they're, that they're, you know, not, not kind of managing on their own, on their own property, and then combining that with incentives for folks that are willing to manage it on, on their own property. So you know, folks that are willing to have, you know, pervious pavers that, you know, have more, less of the runoff wind up in the adjacent waterway, um, you know, really trying to manage, you know, kind of both the volume and the velocity of water. Um, so we're not having, you know, these kind of massive flash floods or you know, mass amounts of pollution that are you know, coming off Parking lots or other types of other types of impervious surfaces. Um, so I mean, the, that's a bigger government you know, kind of conversation. And obviously, you know, in places that are so risk averse on the tax side. I mean, the crazy thing about the about the stormwater utility is that places that don't make these investments end up paying for it out of their general tax base. It ends up being a lot more expensive. Again, it's there's kind of a theme around this ounce of prevention being worth a pound of cure. Um, so I, I mean, I really think that basically making sure that you know, policymakers at the city council level, or even county level, are thinking about kind of how those, how those risks and how those costs are being alloc- are kind of being shifted either towards government or towards other property owners if folks aren't you know, kind of managing their, um, their impacts on their own property. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a basic fairness question, right? I mean, like the neighbor that's you know, slightly upstream of you, you know, paving over everything, so then all of a sudden you get a flash flood in, in your backyard. You know, I'd argue there's, it's not just like kind of a human contract there and kind of a, a golden rule problem. I mean, there's actually a legal liability issue um, as well as an economic risk. And so I, I, think it's, I think it's having really clear real world examples. And look, as much as like you and I may want to talk about, you know, the nutrient loads or like how that affects like algal blooms or like dissolved oxygen levels. I think we should start talking about how flooding out, you know, other neighbors or having, you know, entire like, you know, public infrastructure, you know, whether it's roads that get, you know, displaced or hurt or sinkholes that open up. I mean, the devastation that can come from flooding. And you know, this isn't on the peninsula side, but like an elegant city in Maryland, right? Where like years of, of development outside of the, of the municipality, municipal, municipality levels on these you know, kind of hills on either side, you know, it's creating these just massive kind of almost super highways of like you know, of water you know, rushing into this historic community has been devastating. And it's almost entirely, I mean, like there, there's siting issues down there. There's some wetlands that should have been protected. But at the end of the day, 90% of the crises they face are not of their making, right? It's, it's, it's the county approving projects um, that just paved over absolutely everything as they created another corporate park. Um, like those are conversations that I think are good to have. But I think, I think the combination of bringing the problem, bringing some solutions, bringing some models from other communities in the region that have done a good job, and there's lots of them, um, and then having the types of projects that can show that look, we can not only manage the water and kind of clean up the nutrients and the pollution, we can also beautify things, right? I mean, like, you know, places that have rain gardens and have healthier trees and, you know, some kind of, you know, buffers, um, their property values are higher, right? I mean, the folks want to live in these places. There's a reason why, you know, we like to go and vacation and live in places that have you know, high levels of canopy or high levels of um, vegetation. So we can win this argument. I'd love to, if there's ways we can talk offline with our teams, but I, I do think um, particularly as the, this administration's EPA is going to have more permanent requirements from stormwater management, like now is a good time to start having these conversations, especially if you can bring boatloads of money to actually do the work. So it's going to be a little easier. So, um, but great question. Yeah, I always think of um, flood parks in Amsterdam as sort of one of those examples. Um, yeah, exactly. All right, so last question. Um, I'm going to butcher this name, Cheryl Hayek. Um, how do you stem the tide of residential development that threatens our natural resources? Yeah, I mean, like this is a, I mean, it's a pretty, <laughs> it's a pretty big question to end with. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I mean, a lot, I mean, we, we still live in this, you know, kind of federalist system, right? Where most land use decisions are delegated down to the, the local government level and local governments fund themselves through, um, 
you know, primarily through property taxes. Um, I mean, the economic incentives of developing, despite you know the massive values that are being lost um, on, on the ecological side and also just on the economic side, um, is a battle that you know I think we, we we still lose out in many cases. You know, there's an example I use at the federal level where you know it's wonderful. Like one of the programs that I'm sure the the Land Conservancy uses all the time are, are conservation easements and trying to get folks to protect their land and they get a great tax benefit for that. But if they had that same land and, and, and folks out of the goodness of their heart, right, in many cases are, are taking advantage of, and there's an absolutely an economic benefit, you know, kind of the you know, 80, 90 percent of the value of the land in some cases, which is fine if the option is kind of doing nothing versus conserving. But, you know, the economics and the return on the subdivision are greater than the value. And there's some risk, um, but the net profits are higher from a subdivision than they are from just the tax, the conservation easement. And so we're waging a, a kind of a battle right now on the Hill with a lot of conservatives, actually. Um, to basically create more tax incentives um, to allow folks to conserve land and have it be basically just a, a fair fight. I mean, I feel like in some cases we're kind of showing up with a, a knife to a gunfight, um, where you know the big developer comes in and says, "Hey, I'm going to I'm going to squeeze you know 120 you know units on this you know five acre parcel, um, and we're going to offer you you know 10 million dollars to do it." And we come back with our conservation easement saying, "Oh yeah, it might be worth like a million or two. Um, like we're just we're just getting out we're getting outmatched." And so. I think, you know, I'd love to see a world, I mean, the Nature Conservancy is doing a great job with this. I mean, you know, we shouldn't be taxing, you know, capital gains on land conservation. We should be making sure that the conservation tax credits um, are matching not just the value of the property, but the highest and best use um, if there was development. They, there's this great idea that, that we've been working on um, with Cory Booker and Tim Scott and some others around, um, there's, this, there's this, these opportunity zones um, that have been created through the, the, the last tax package. We had a lot of bad stuff, but this was kind of a cool program. And the idea was to drive capital investment into low-income communities and, and you know, kind of frontline communities that have been struggling. Um, why not do the same thing to direct capital flows into, into high-priority ecological areas, places that are in state wildlife action plans or bay program plans? Or, and so I, I, for me, like this is an economics problem as much as it's a land use problem, but I don't fault local governments that are struggling to kind of keep you know, schools open and cops on the street from taking the cheap money. I think we got to do a better job coming up with solutions to show it's in their economic interest in their public safety interest, in their health interest, in their economic interest, to actually make the right choice ecologically. Um, but we got some work to do there, especially given the development pressures we're going to see. Yeah, thank you so much, Colin. Um, with that, we're going to transition back to Jim. And but really quick, if we didn't get to your questions, um, there could be possibilities in the in the future. Um, you'll hear about later. So, with that, Jim, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Tyler. And. Um... Colin, if you're feeling really ambitious and want to uh, get in the chat and try to address some of the good questions that popped up there, um, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. That was a really, really awesome presentation. Uh, so up next, we have a, a tag team uh, presentation for our second one, uh, Jessica Granis and Katie Spidlieri. Uh, Jessica is the interim vice president of coastal conservation at the National Audubon Society. Jessica joined Audubon as Coastal Resilience Director in 2019. And before that, Jessica served as the Georgetown Climate Center's Adaptation Program Director for 10 years, where she supervised staff and student research and analysis of federal, state, and local climate adaptation efforts. Um, she will also be joined by Katie Spidlieri. Katie is a senior associate at the Georgetown Climate Center, and she provides legal and policy analysis on adaptation projects at the federal, state, and local levels. Her work focuses on adaptation in the coastal sector, including evaluating land use and other tools and strategies, such as managed retreat to adapt to rising sea levels and flooding. Uh, so I think that Jessica and Katie tag teaming are gonna be a great second presentation for us. Thank you guys so much for being with us and Katie and Jessica, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks, Jim. And I got a tough act to follow with Colin, but he set me up wonderfully and I'm very excited to be with my old friends at the Eastern Shore Land Conservancy who I worked with for many years through the SCAP partnership on climate adaptation and my old colleague and partner in crime Katie Spidalieri but I'm going to follow up on a lot of things that, that Colin talked about and ways that Audubon is thinking about similar opportunities and challenges as it relates to federal opportunities to promote natural infrastructure, but also talk about ways that you and your different roles that you're playing, um, if you're a resident, if you're a local official, if you're a concerned citizen can engage in these topics and, and 
push for nature-based solutions in your own community. In terms of um, Audubon and our particular interest in these topics, we are, our mission is to protect birds in the places they need today and tomorrow. And so looking out to what climate change is doing to our landscape and how that's affecting birds on the ground. But birds are also an important indicator to the health and durability of the ecosystems that we rely on for habitats, but also that provide these important natural flood buffers and first line of defenses for communities. And birds are telling us that we're in trouble. <laughs> We've lost 3 billion birds since the 1970s with a 70% decline in shorebird and seabird populations over the last 50 years. Um, part of this, as Colin was, was mentioning, is due to the squeeze of coastal habitats on one side by increasing development and on the other side from sea level rise and increasing flooding and loss of habitat. And this is also playing out on the ground in communities. A trillion dollars worth of coastal properties are at risk of sea level rise by the end of the century. And 41 million Americans are at risk of flooding along US rivers and streams. And natural infrastructure can play a really important role in terms of helping us address these challenges. And as Colin was talking about as well, and to put a blunder point on all of that, um, the benefits of natural infrastructure are not only that they reduce flood and storm surge risk in communities and provide a more durable solution that grows and builds over time as compared to gray infrastructure solutions, but these are solutions that deliver multiple different benefits across um, the environment, economic benefits and social benefits. So at Audubon, we are interested in these types of approaches because of the benefits to, to birds and wildlife and, and communities, but, in, but they also help us reduce water and air pollution. They create these opportunities for recreational amenities that we've all been craving uh, as we've been socially distancing at home. Colin mentioned the job creation benefits of these types of, these types of investments and the opportunities to sequester carbon pollution and deal with the causes of climate change that are causing seas to rise and oceans to warm and creating these challenges on the ground. And this is just an image from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration that shows the different kinds of natural infrastructure approaches and how these types of solutions can be used in both a coastal flood context but also an inland stormwater flood context and in an inland you know, drought and other to address other natural hazards. Um, so at Audubon, a lot of these issues have been touched upon, but this is sort of the ways that we're thinking about federal policy opportunities to promote natural infrastructure. So looking at the land use practices and how are we promoting climate smart land use practices on the ground, creating those incentives for communities uh, to preserve and protect these natural assets and natural solutions, um, driving funding to the ground to important um, ecosystem restoration and conservation programs, but also looking at some of the programs that fund more traditional gray infrastructure approaches and how do we green and incorporate natural infrastructure, pro, natural infrastructure approaches into these programs that receive billions of dollars and direct billions of dollars of resources annually um, from funding at the federal level that then gets matched at the state and local level. So things like our disaster recovery and hazard mitigation program we talked about the Water Resources Development Act and core, Army Corps funding. Surface transportation is another big opportunity this Congress um, where they need to pass a reauthorization for surface transportation and there's opportunities to promote natural infrastructure policy within that bill. And then this big opportunity presented by stimulus funding and 
um, Congress directing resources through a variety of different programs to support economic recovery from COVID and how do we ensure that restoration is part of that equation. And then finally thinking about blue carbon solutions and how do we make coastal habitats and resources and marine ecosystems as part of the set of solutions that we're looking at to reduce carbon pollution, to capture and store carbon pollution. And that can be a longer term source of funding for these types of restoration projects. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about more of these in depth. Um, so the first, and we talked a little bit about the National Flood Insurance Program and the role that plays in terms of encouraging um, states to, or local governments to adopt land use practices that address flood risk. So this program, if you're not familiar with it, it's administered by the Federal Emergency Management Agency or FEMA. And the federal government offers subsidized flood insurance in exchange for communities agreeing to regulate land use in areas that have flood risk, which FEMA determines based upon floodplain maps that they develop and they map an area that they say has a 1% chance of flooding in any given year. And in that area, you have to apply land use regulations that require people to build to be more resilient to flood impacts. The problem with the program is those maps don't account for increasing flood risk for, from climate change, both changing precipitation patterns and sea level rise. And in many communities, those maps are decades out of date. And so communities are using imperfect information to help um, residents decide where to build and how to redevelop and how to redevelop in a way that doesn't exacerbate flood risk. But one component of the program is a subprogram called community rating, the community rating system, which is an incentive based program that's designed to encourage communities to go above and beyond those minimum floodplain regulation regulatory standards. And we worked with the SCAP communities when I was at Georgetown on helping them better understand how the community rating system could be used as a tool to help them implement policies on the ground that would build their resilience to the flood risks that they know are increasing on the ground. Um, and one of the benefits of this program, particularly in places like the Eastern Shore, where you, the one real asset that you have is a lot of natural space and open lands that are really highly valued under the community rating system. So protecting and preserving those natural assets is a way to earn a lot of points under the community rating system and increase your level that you're awarded under the system. The other benefit of it is that those, um, the more points you earn, the greater flood insurance discounts you get for residents in your community. So that has dual benefits of reducing costs for residents. They have money that stays in their pocket. It doesn't go to the federal government um, and that they can spend in the community, but it also helps the community justify measures to protect these uh, important natural assets that are reducing flood losses. Um, so that's one opportunity and one way to engage with your your local officials is by encouraging them to participate in this program that will not only create incentives for them to address flood risk, but also create economic incentives for, re for residents in terms of reduced premiums. Um, another big opportunity is through disaster recovery and hazard mitigation programs. Um, natural and nature-based solutions are a strategy that some communities are starting to consider uh, as they think about recovering and rebuilding after a big disaster event. Um, but these types of projects face a lot of barriers in terms of getting implemented through um, the various programs. So there's really important opportunities to engage with the federal, state, and local agencies that control these um, these dollars. 
this map on the right shows a project that Audubon is working on in Mastic Beach in New York on Long Island, where after Hurricane Sandy, this community was devastated. And rather than rebuild in the same footprint, they really engaged deeply on how to enhance their natural flood buffers um, and promote managed retreat and buyout, voluntary buyouts from repetitively flood flooded homes. Audubon's helping with a small portion of the project down here in the left-hand corner where they're removing a flood damaged road and restoring 1.75 acres of salt marsh that's then going to improve the health of 40 acres of adjacent salt marsh by restoring tidal flow to that area. And just this tiny, pretty small footprint project um, we worked with an economics firm called Earth Economics and they helped us look at the flood risk reduction, improved ecosystem health, recreational benefits, other environmental benefits of this project. And it's estimated that this project for every dollar spent will return $15, $15 in, in benefits to the community. Um, so this is helping us inform our engagement with with FEMA on a couple new developments. In 2018, Congress passed the Disaster Recovery and Reform Act, which set aside 6% of disaster relief appropriations to fund pre-disaster mitigation in communities to help them reduce risk before a disaster strikes. And FEMA is administering this uh, funding through a program that they've called the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program, or BRIC. And it's estimated that with that 6% set aside in the active hurricane and fire season, we've had um, that there's about up to $3 billion sitting in this piggy bank to be allocated in the coming grant cycles. And although FEMA has prioritized nature-based solutions in its criteria, um, we see significant barriers to really deploying these dollars to the kinds of beneficial uh, nature-based approaches that we would like to see on the ground. So I think there's big opportunities for NGOs like ESLC, concerned residents, state and local officials um, to work with their state hazard mitigation officers and local emergency officials both at the hazard mitigation planning stages to identify nature-based projects that can help reduce flood risks in communities, but also to encourage those agencies to advance natural infrastructure projects for funding to FEMA to make sure that we're, you know, they're they're really truly considering these multi-benefit kinds of projects on the ground. Um, the other new development that happened in Congress last year was they passed a new Storm Act, um, which is creating a program at FEMA that's similar to the state revolving funds that EPA administers for investments in water infrastructure, but to create resilience revolving funds at the state level that can then support investments in hazard mitigation at the, at the state and local level. Um, again, there's opportunities here to inform how FEMA rolls out this program, how states implement the new revolving fund at the state level, and then states, once they have their programs in place and there's capitalization dollars sent to these programs to fund them and to implement projects, the states will have to develop intended use plans similar to the state revolving funds. Um, so there's opportunities to engage at all of those levels to ensure that nature-based solutions are part of the mix of projects that can be funded through these programs. Um, and in both of these programs, Audubon is looking for a nature-based solution set aside that FEMA would implement similar to how EPA administers the state revolving funds and encourages green infrastructure solutions to address stormwater pollution through a green project reserve set aside. So that's something that we're looking for on the Hill. Um, and then Colin talked about the opportunities presented by the 2020 Water Resources Development Act, which authorizes Army Corps of Engineers 
the Army Corps of Engineers to support projects. And a couple big pieces of the bill really help to advance this cause of um, directing more core resources to nature-based approaches. And these are billions of dollars flowing to the core annually to support coastal resilience, flood control projects, navigation projects, and ecosystem restoration that could really make a big uh, dent in having less concrete poured and putting more seeds and <laughs> soils in the ground and encouraging more of these nature based approaches. So the first was putting natural and projects that incorporate natural and nature based features, the core's language for natural infrastructure, unequal cost share footing with more traditional gray infrastructure projects, um, providing support for coastal resilience planning and economically underserved and rural communities. Um, so supporting their efforts to assess their flood risk and develop ideas and solutions for addressing flood risk. And then finally, uh, upping the number of projects that can be pursued through beneficial use of dredge material pilot program and reforming the cost or the, the benefit cost analysis for both um, what Colin was talking about in terms of least cost disposal or benefit you know, beneficial use. So looking at the environmental benefits of using those dredge sediments rather than disposing of them. And I'll talk to you a little bit about, this is map shows um, a project in Charleston Harbor where the Corps proposal for reducing flood risk in Charleston was really a, a purely gray infrastructure approach and a coalition of environmental organizations, universities, NGOs, design firms, came up with a, a alternative plan called Imagine the Wall that looked at ways that natural nature-based features could better be integrated into this core project. So even when the core is engaging in large-scale infrastructure projects, there's opportunities to engage as a citizen or as an NGO um, and comment on those proposals and encourage the core to do better in terms of looking at natural features. Um, one of the efforts of Audubon was working in the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge and the Blackwater 2100 plan and looking at how sea level rise was going to affect marshes and salt marshes habitat in that region and, and looking at different ways that marshes could be adaptively managed to naturally help those marshes cope with sea level rise, as well as preserving upland marsh migration corridors to enable those marshes to move inland and um, sustain over time because they have a new place to reestablish. And one of the ways that they're doing that is um, in terms of helping marshes adapt is by using partnering with the core um, and using beneficial dredge sediments to um, re-nourish and build the elevation of marshes so that they can cope with rising sea levels. It's called a thin layer disposal or thin layer placement projects. And so our my colleague, Dave Kersen, who's a little bit of a celebrity given his, um, feature, his feature presentation in the High Tide on Dorchester movie is working with a bunch of different partners, including ESLC, on work to rebuild marshes around the, the refuge in this area using um, core support and fish and wildlife support. So another opportunity to engage in on the ground projects to sustain and maintain these habitats that are being degraded as sea levels rise and um, the the rot, roots are rotting of, of this, these ecosystems. And then finally, there are opportunities to discuss or to support legislation that would um, help us advance the science on blue carbon resources. So understanding how coastal habitats capture and sequester carbon pollution 
putting funding to conserve and restore coastal habitats that sequester carbon pollution, and then laying the groundwork for a potential offset credit market that could um, help us not only reduce the carbon pollution that's causing climate change, but invest in these efforts to restore and conserve these important ecosystems. So with that, I will turn it over to my partner in crime, Katie, who's going to walk through some state and local opportunities. Thanks so much, Jessica, and thanks to all of you for joining us on a Tuesday night. I feel like I'm a broadcast announcer, um, and I appreciate that ESLC and Tyler and Jim are hosting us. All right, let me share my screen and then I will roll right into my presentation. All right, I assume and hope you all are seeing my slides and not my talking points. Um, if not, Jim or Tyler, please let me know. Uh, so Colin and Jessica gave us a great setup of looking at how you can incorporate and encourage natural solutions at the federal level. Uh, but for a couple minutes, we're gonna take a snapshot of what's going on at state and local levels um, for how individually or collaboratively they can work together to facilitate natural solutions. Ideally, um, these types of solutions that are developed will have resonance and support from the federal, state, and local levels, um, but that's not always the case um, based on sort of the different types of legal and policy tools that different levels of government have. Uh, right now, I'm going to take a look at some different mechanisms through which state and local governments are pursuing um, emphasizing sort of natural solutions through natural or nature-based features or green infrastructure or other types of things. Um, so I'm not gonna focus on like best practices or examples of where things have been used, um, but give you an idea if you're a policymaker of some ways that other jurisdictions in the Delmarva Peninsula and outside are doing things, or if you're not a policymaker and you're a citizen and are looking for things to try and work with your um, state and local governments on, this will give you a flavor. Um, to that end, I'm gonna look at some different planning tools and then some like regulatory rules where you'd have like requirements by statute or regulation. And then we're gonna take a look at some financing tools and then round things out um, before our question and answer session. So not surprisingly, plans are really important tools to organize the way people are thinking about things and trying to prioritize how nature and natural solutions are being pursued uh, as part of a state or local government's climate adaptation strategy. Uh, working at Georgetown Climate Center and having sort of a landscape view of what's going on, um, it's really important to see, and it's exciting to see, you know, the number of initiatives and pl planning at the state and local level that are really going on in this region. Um, as you see on your screen, there's a couple uh, examples of current ones. Um, Delaware's Climate Action Plan. Um, this year, the state will release its first combined climate mitigation and adaptation plan, um, where natural resources is one of the focuses of that plan. Uh, Maryland is in the process of updating its climate action plan, or what it will be called, I think, a framework, um, which will focus on adaptation. Um, the one you see on the screen is from 2008. And then Virginia just released its coastal master planning framework, um, which basically over the course of this year, Virginia will release, it's called its coastal master plan, which will essentially prioritize what uh, projects would be completed on the coast that would meet its coastal resilience goals. Um, and those projects are ultimately sort of be allocated for priorities for funding. Um, in addition, I know Maryland has just released last year it, the nation's first saltwater intrusion and salinization plan. Um, and from that, they're working on developing coastal wetland easements and uh, a wetland adaptation action plan. So a lot going on. Um, plans are really key, and it's a great place for both policymakers and citizens to get involved and be engaged in these processes because what can come out of them can be around for a longer term uh, planning period, whether you have a shorter term, maybe like five year horizon versus something longer. Um, but also by putting things in the plan, not only do you draw attention to them, but you can potentially have, um, you know, in this instance, it wouldn't be a shovel ready project because you're not often dealing with construction, but you'll have designs and ideas for plans that have already been vetted by policymakers and communities, and when and if funding is available, um, then you can enhance your chances of having those projects actually implemented on the ground, either through you know, purchasing land, acquiring it to conserve it, or um, engaging in different types of restoration projects. So I encourage you to take a look at sort of what these plans are going on at the state level, uh, and also throughout the region and at the local level, um, because they'll be key to setting up the stage for climate resilience and adaptation and the incorporation of natural uh, solutions going forward. So moving from planning tools, I'm um, thinking about zoning and land use. 
So zoning and land use plans and regulations are one of the principal ways that communities can really influence the location and conservation of natural resources and habitats, uh, which may even involve prioritizing different ones um, based on local needs and interests and priorities. Um, so for example, in my work, I'm increasingly seeing um, potential conflicts emerging between people who um, are you know, productive users of forests or um, prioritize that ha habitat over wetlands. And so as sea level rises, and wetlands potentially migrate inland, how is that going to affect forest users and people who just love that environment? Uh, with zoning and land use, the power is inherently local. And if you're looking at potentially updating your local uh, land use plans or your zoning and land use ordinances, it's important to think about, do you already have things in place, uh, you know, conservation ordinances or requirements that could just incorporate climate data um, to be more up-to-date with the threats that communities will face now and into the future? Or is there a need to sort of look at things holistically and see how climate can be put into these plans um, sort of from the start? One important thing to think about is that, uh, just as I sort of cited with that migrating wetlands example with them changing places and moving inland, um, our environments and our communities are not necessarily gonna be the same today as they are tomorrow and years down the road. So how can you incorporate like adaptive management and other sort of long-term visioning into regulations and zoning. One example of a tool um, that's being increasingly used to advance climate adaptation and resilience and can feature uh, natural solutions is using something called an overlay zone or district. An overlay zone essentially is a zone um, or a layer that basically is above a base zoning district that for some reason adds additional requirements or considerations based on the boundaries of that zone. So for example, um, Yankee Town, which is a rural community in Florida that has a lot of salt marshes and salt forests that are at threat from sea level rise. Essentially, they used a state authorized tool, which is essentially an overlay district to create what they called a national natural resource adaptation action area, which is an overlay district that covers approximately 89% of the community. Uh, so that way it helps guide um, land use and zoning decisions for the government going forward. So primarily it does two things. So first, uh, it identifies areas within the community that the local government could identify as a priority area for acquisition in the future to preserve um, marsh and forest habitats. And second, it basically places an increasing obligation upon Yankee Town and the government to look at siting development so that way it's compatible with the local government's changing environment. So for example, uh, the government could look at not siting infrastructure in like marsh migration pathways, or it could maybe um, approve development that's consistent with marsh migration. So maybe it would elevate the structure enough so that way uh, you know, marshes could migrate underneath it. Obviously that would be different for forests. Uh, but it, the, this example is really used to sort of highlight the importance of sort of being creative um, with zoning and land use decisions at the local level. Um, also thinking about um, the data that you have to support the decisions that you want to make over a longer term horizon. So the next example of sort of a regulatory tool that I want to talk about um, is permitting and environmental compliance. So when I say permitting and environmental compliance, what do I really mean? So with permitting, uh, this could apply at both the state and the local level in terms of government approvals or authorizations for actions you want to take. Um, so in my work, a lot of that really deals with approvals from the state coastal management program for development in the coastal zone, and that could be at the state or local level. Uh, but in addition, permitting happens at the local level, uh, like we just talked about with zoning and land use, um, if development's going to occur within a jurisdiction. Environmental compliance is often called environmental review and also occurs at both the state and local levels. So at the state level, um, there are the analogs of the Federal National Environmental Policy Act. You have state equivalents of that. And at the local level in zoning ordinances, you will usually have environmental review criteria or requirements that you have to meet um, to be able to obtain a local land use permit. A lot of states are increasingly leading in this area. Um, some of you may be aware of Maryland's CoSmart requirements. Um, New York and California are also exemplars in this area. Um, New Jersey and Florida recently passed uh, executive and legislative mandates that will now require the consideration of climate change in decisions. And all of these can essentially be used to seek ways to prioritize the use of natural solutions um, to provide a lot of community benefits that Colin and Jessica have talked about, but also to look at mitigating flood risk. Um, of note, you see on your screen, um, New York State's uh, Community Resilience and uh, Community Risk and Resiliency Act, CRRA, 
um, basically did this required the consideration of climate uh, change impacts, uh, storm impacts, and sea level rise in certain funding and permitting programs that the state oversees um, to help implement that act. So policymakers were more aware of how natural measures could be incorporated into project design and siting and also the public could be more aware of it. Um, the state released last year different guidance documents, including the one you see on your screen, to try and help prioritize and elevate the use of these. Um, so looking for ways uh, to basically incorporate natural solutions into different types of permits or reviews that people are doing, um, especially when you're looking at environmental impacts analysis and different alternatives that people could consider. Um, I think this is an increasing way that states and local governments will prioritize um, natural solutions and climate adaptation and resilience more broadly. Uh, rounding things out, the last set of tools we're looking at is thinking about how do you fund or finance natural solutions. Um, a lot of what will be done will require significant funding, um, particularly to acquire land or to conduct restoration projects. Um, there are two states that have recently created resilience revolving loan funds um, for resilience specifically. Uh, so Virginia has a community flood preparedness fund and South Carolina has a resilience revolving loan fund. Uh, currently, Virginia is estimating that in this calendar year, or fiscal year, uh, there will be about $60 million um, allocated to that revolving loan fund. And the hope is that, you know, in both of the legal mandates for um, these two resilience revolving loan funds, um, they really prioritize the use of natural solutions, particularly to mit mitigate flood risk, and also to direct funding and grants and try to subsidize grants and things like that to underserved and overburdened communities. Um, so it'll be interesting to sort of see the progress of where this goes, uh, because a lot of states and local governments are increasingly evaluating revolving loan fund options, um, and as Jessica talked about with the STORM Act. There's also some examples of local uh, revolving loan funds where uh, local governments are essentially creating like rainy day funds or an ability to help uh, their communities with funding when there's a uh, federal or state shortage. The one I want example I want to talk about a little bit uh, is, you know, Colin mentioned the idea of existing revolving loan funds, um, in particular the Clean Water uh, State Revolving Loan Fund, which is under the Clean Water Act at the federal level. Every year, states receive capitalization grants um, to conduct uh, projects essentially that will help, you know, with water supplies, improve water quality, and that's the focus of the Clean Water Act. Um, Ohio has one of the nation's longest standing clean water revolving funds, and they've done an interesting thing. So they have their big overarching fund and they allocate um, every year since 2000, 15 million um, for a specific um, project type. And so this specific $15 million is allocated through Ohio's Water Resource Restoration Sponsor Program. And essentially people who are recipients of grants uh, or loans through the state revolving fund can choose to sponsor a project that could be implemented by the government or another entity like a nonprofit. Um, so maybe it could be, uh, you know, purchasing land or uh, restoring streams or wetlands. Um, and ultimately, the local government then um, is fronted the cost of that project um, by the state. So the state has enough funds to be able to help implement projects faster. So it's not a long term thing. And then in return, the person who is the, you know, loan recipient like the local government is able to have a reduced or a forgiven interest on what that loan would have been. So they not only get a financial benefit for it, but they do something good for their community. Um, this is a model that EPA has resources on um, and Ohio is a great resource as well that I think could be replicated elsewhere. Um, the emphasis really has to link back to the main purpose of the Clean Water Act. Uh, and in that sense, uh, you know, anything that Ohio does that's funding through this has to preserve and restore habitat to ultimately improve water quality. Um, but in the time that this program has been around, uh, the state has spent um, 195 million on 148 projects that's uh, you know, preserved and restored uh, thousands of acres of wetlands and stream habitat and also resulted in dam removals as well. Um, so this is an area where compared to Virginia and South Carolina, maybe a state or local government wouldn't have to think about starting from scratch, but could look to create um, innovative projects through existing needs. So the last thing I want to talk about is um, in terms of thinking about financing, uh, you know, especially due to COVID and other challenges state and local governments are facing. Maybe there's opportunities to look at sort of your entire asset portfolio to enhance and um, invest in natural solutions without having to spend as much um, hard money. Uh, so one idea is uh, if there are opportunities for 
uh, state, and especially I think local governments, to look into this tool called a land swap. A land swap is essentially you have at least two property owners, property owner A and B. Let's pretend property owner A is a government and B is a private property owner. In a land swap, A and B decide voluntarily on their own. So, you know, a government isn't using eminent domain to change or swap title to their property. So the government A would take over the title to property B person. Eh, this is what happens when you create uh, examples. Person B's property and B would get title to A. Um, things like this could be used in a climate context, especially where you're gonna potentially have vulnerable areas on the coast or areas that would ideally be used to invest in natural or nature-based solutions to mitigate flood risk or provide communities other benefits um, and potentially give uh, community residents title to land somewhere else that's safer inland away from these risks. Um, you could also think about this, I think, in an ag agricultural context. Um, so where farmers are being impacted by saltwater intrusion or salinization, is there a way to sort of transfer their development rights to somewhere else um, where there's gonna be more productive land? Um, as a brief example, uh, Edgemere is a neighborhood in Queens that was impacted by Hurricane Sandy. Um, as part of a broader term community driven recovery plan, um, they basically implemented a small scale land swap where as you compare the top and bottom images, uh, people who owned homes in the, what would now be a green area, swapped title um, to blighted properties that the city owned further inland. So that way they could invest in their communities, create recreational assets, have these natural flood mitigation benefits from creating green space. But they also had the opportunity to go to a safer home and still be a part of their community without having to be displaced. So the bottom line here is just thinking creatively about what different types of assets and tools you have in addition to um, either financing or getting funding like in grants through the federal government um, to prioritize natural solutions. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you so much, Katie and Jessica. Um, so we're running a little bit over, but I wanted to ask sort of a broad general question so you could each get a chance to, um, to respond. So um, we've asked, um, if you could pick one natural protection policy to implement widespread across Delmarva, what would you choose and why? So for me, I think uh, a big area where the rubber meets the road is really at the regional and local level um, through zoning and land use. And so I think if there was a way through, you know, groups like SCAP that ESLC facilitates or other ways um, to provide local governments with the tools that they need um, to look at how they can use their existing plans and zoning ordinances um, to prioritize climate resilience and adaptation and natural solutions. I think that's gonna be a key, um, especially trying to look ahead at what areas will be um, needed for you know, habitat movements and transitions as climate impacts these areas. So looking on a longer term time horizon. Yeah, and we think, you know, you got to deal with the two pressures. One is on the development side and making sure we're preserving and protecting what is there, um, but also just driving more investment to these kinds of projects and demonstrating the efficacy of these types of projects on the ground. So making sure that we're, you know, supporting large scale natural infrastructure projects and then monitoring and reporting back on the lessons we're learning from those projects and their, their effectiveness in these big storm events so that we have um, the information we need to push the agencies to do better and direct more resources to these kinds of projects because that's one of the big barriers is we don't know how effective they are. We don't have solid data on how effective they are. Thank you both so much. With that, I'll hand it over to Jim. Thank you all, Katie and Jessica. That was really, really excellent content. Um, really, really appreciate you guys being with us this evening. Uh, so for our final presentation this evening is Khalil Kettering with the Nature Conservancy. Uh, Khalil is the Urban Conservation Director. Um, Khalil is developing new conservation strategies in Washington, DC, centered on implementing projects that elevate the intersection of protecting nature in urban areas and the benefits nature provides people in cities. He's working to build momentum for the first ever stormwater retention credit trading program in DC. This involves using natural solutions like rain gardens and bioswales that absorb stormwater and reduce runoff into the Anacostia and Potomac rivers. So it sounds like there's going to be a lot of analogs between Khalil's work in DC and how we live our lives here on the Delmarva Peninsula. 
Khalil, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. And um, I'm going to share my screen here. I see we're a little bit over time, so I will try to, can't promise anything, but I will try to make sure that um, I go through this a little bit more expediently. So I have this picture up here. It's also my background, and I like to have this picture up. People often say, wow, look at that picture. Is that down south somewhere? Is that the Everglades? Or is that in the Chesapeake Bay? And no, actually, this is the Anacostia River in Washington, D.C. Uh, if you look to the, on the left side of the picture, you'll see cars on the Route 50 bridge that are driving out to Annapolis from D.C. So I like to have this picture to show people that there is nature, there is wild areas in um, our urban areas that's important. Uh, for our quality of life and our resilience. And you could probably tell it was maybe in DC and you look a little closer and you see all the, the fragmenty there along the waterways. But uh, a little bit over half a decade ago, TNC started to have a little bit of a, a shift in our thinking and, you know, Nature Conservancy, TNC were known as a group. Originally we went out, we would find land that was threatened and we would preserve it. We would raise money to buy it, do stuff in rural areas because it was more pristine. And we started to realize, you know, if we're going to protect these areas that we care about on a macro level, we have to think in urban areas as well. And why is that? Well, yes, 2% of the global footprint is in cities. And yeah, you could say that's small, but almost 70% of the global population will be living in cities in the next 30 years. And so that means 80% of the world's resources are going to be going to cities. So the footprint of a city is not just that 2% land that it sits on. It's got upstream impacts from resource extraction and downstream impacts from stormwater, air pollution, et cetera, other types of issues um, and emissions. So our work in cities, we're looking at water quality, stormwater, flooding that happens, sea level rise, biodiversity and habitat, uh, air quality in urban heat islands, and then of course people and the nature, which is a big part of that as well. And a lot of, large part of my work is stormwater. And so to give a primer, I don't want to make assumptions that everyone's familiar with it, but stormwater is when it rains, that water used to seep into the ground naturally, it used to have forests, uh, used to be green areas, but now it hits impervious surfaces, your roads, your sidewalks, your rooftops. And when it does that, it picks up all the trash, the cigarette butts, the grease from your car. Think about every time you press your brakes on your car, there's chemicals that are coming off your car and they're just sitting on the roadway. And our roads are designed so efficiently to funnel all of that stormwater into catchment basins, taking all that trash and then dumping it into our rivers um, and having serious impacts on our rivers. This is uh, the Anacostia River after major storm event and no this is not the 1960s or 70s this is just uh, a couple years ago this picture is taken from so you see the impact that that has and it has an impact on our wildlife there but also on people a lot of people fish in these rivers for sustenance um, and so there's an equity issue you know it's people who don't have the resources to go to a store to buy protein or live in food deserts and so having clean water in these areas is important, not just for nature itself, but also for the people that live there. Um, and stormwater has a, a macro impact. It doesn't just affect the city. This is me. I shouldn't be smiling in this picture, but I am. Um, and this is in Rock Creek Park in DC. And you can see the erosion that's happening there from the stormwater. Um, and we know about the impact that stormwater has on the Chesapeake Bay. You know, it's, it's the largest growing source of pollution. And in DC alone, 25 billion gallons to my uh, Dr. Evil voice, billion gallons every year of stormwater flows off of impervious surfaces in DC, it ends up in the Anacostia, Rock Creek, the Potomac, and ultimately Chesapeake Bay, which affects many of us. But it also has impacts on our municipalities and our infrastructure. If you look at the picture in the middle here, for anybody that lives in DC, this is the Cleveland Park Metro Station. A couple years ago, we had a massive rain event and we know with climate change, we're gonna be having more of those cloud bursts where in a space of like 15 to 20 minutes, we had several inches of rain that flooded the Metro that people couldn't even walk out of it safely. 
Um, you see on these other pictures here, again, this is Rock Creek Park on the right. You see the impacts of this flooding and it's gonna have more and more on our municipal infrastructure, on our budgets. So thinking about how we handle that is gonna be critical. And green infrastructure plays a big role there. And green infrastructure, GI, um, you might see it in places where you, you don't even recognize, you know, if you're, you'll see it sometimes in, in um, parking lots, at strip malls or at grocery stores, um, where the whole concept is redesigning nature back into the city to help solve some of these challenges and to help nature heal itself, right? We know if you give nature a chance, it can heal itself pretty well. And so how it works is in, in the green infrastructure in this parking lot, the stormwater is designed to flow into this rain garden or bioretention. And there's multiple layers of filtering, the plants, the mulch, the special biomediate soil, the filter fabric, the gravel, all filters out different levels of pollutants. So by the time the water gets to the bottom and filters into the ground, the natural water table or into the under drain and back out into the, the drains into the rivers, it's so much more cleaner but not just cleaner, it's also cooler, right? If, if you stand on a parking lot in July or August, that's hot. And so the problem with stormwater is thermal as well as the, the chemical. Um, and then it's, it's, causing, it's slowing it down from causing erosion as well and slowing down the velocity of that stormwater by going through, going through this green infrastructure. And so some examples of some projects we've been involved in over the past with partners, Anacostia Watershed Society led this project um, at a church where you see this parking lot and this is what it, it could look like. This is what it looked like after where you have stormwater that's being filtered and captured um, and you have these natural trees that are going in, um, the river birch that's also creating habitat and reducing urban heat island as well. Uh, cemetery in DC where we've done a big project, Mount Olivet Cemetery, which has a very fascinating cultural heritage. It's the first racially integrated cemetery in DC, actually. So you've got this rich history of African-American history and graves of people who were enslaved there, um, as well as, as people who were white that were there from before the Civil War. And it gets a lot of flooding on major rain events. And we working with the, the, uh, the cemetery there, we've been able to put in many different bioretention cells that have native plants that bring in um, uh, pollinator species, but also when flooding, huge flood events happen, we've noticed that within 24 hours, that water is filtering through the green infrastructure and it's serving its purpose. But uh, I think a previous presenter mentioned the importance of gray infrastructure and you know, gray is what you think, gray, like concrete. Um, tunnels underground, like what DC Water has been building in DC, it's the size of a, a metro tunnel. It still serves a purpose, it's still important. And many times, you know, it's sometimes we need hybrid approaches. Sometimes we need to look at each situation and say, well, which one works in this municipality in this in this time with this budget? Um, for example, this is some old gray infrastructure from the 1880s in DC, um, where we see those tunnels they're in disrepair, right? And that's part of the reason why DC Water is building this, but we see how gray infrastructure over time decays and depreciates and, and you have to really keep an eye on it. Um, and then of course, on the left is Ellicott City with the major floods that happened a couple of years ago. And on the right is Baltimore and green infrastructure, the rain gardens cannot solve this problem you still need gray infrastructure to handle this type of flooding and, and these type of events and thinking about zoning codes as previous uh, speakers mentioned and, and how do we address some of these issues. Um, so sometimes we hear green infrastructure as this panacea to solve all these issues with flooding and rain events and it can help a lot, but we still need to think about realistically some of these areas that were built in floodplains, we're gonna need to have hybrid solutions to deal with that. But green infrastructure also um, captures many other things. And in a city, when we're talking about green infrastructure and resilience, trees are a, such an important tool for uh, handling many of our issues, not just with stormwater, but we know that in, in DC, I think it was Colin was mentioning about urban heat islands and, and urban versus rural 
areas. And here in DC, you see the blue areas, Rock Creek Park, Fort DuPont, you know, it's 85 degrees. And in the areas that doesn't have a lot of tree canopy, it's 102 degrees there, a huge swing, 20 degree difference. So we know that having tree canopy is critical to the resilience of our cities to deal with climate change, hotter um, temperatures, et cetera. And we need to think about how we're going to uh, develop budgets around getting that in and equitably. Looking at these two pictures, which area looks like more inviting, more desirable? You know, the, the green, the trees, studies show that as humans, we are drawn to green, to want to go to those areas. And many times in cities, the areas that get the most dedicated and attention on trees and greenery and green infrastructure are the wealthier areas. And we know that in some some areas, you know, your zip code in some cities that have a higher tree canopy also dictate what your lifespan is. So we need to make sure that we have equity in addressing tree canopy and green infrastructure, dispersing it in areas that really don't have enough of it as well. Um, so there's equity there. And just thinking about G green infrastructure benefits in general, we know there's benefits for nature, right? There's habitat benefits in DC. We're seeing um, bald eagles nesting along the Anacostia River for the past five years for the first time since D-Day, right? Since, since 1944. Um, stormwater runoff trees and green infrastructure are great for dealing with that. But for residents too, they, they provide shade. They help to reduce um, CO2 emissions because of the shade they provide as energy savings. And, and the bottom picture here is National Stadium in DC. Go Nats, I'm a native Washingtonian, one of those few endemic species. Um, and I one time made the mistake a few years ago, going to a meeting, wearing a suit in August, walking around National Stadium where there's very little shade and tree canopy. And I practically melted like, Wizard of Oz, it was nuts. And, and that's where you, it really hits home, the importance of having trees and, and of dealing with shade because it's just gonna get hotter and it's gonna impact people more. Human health, um, trees having green infrastructure improves air quality. Actually, uh, the Nature Conservancy in Louisville is doing a study on human health impacts related to tree canopy um, and sp specific uh, types of green infrastructure and how it impacts people over time. Um, it is improves physical and mental health. People get out more, getting out in nature improves your, your mental health and improves social cohesion as people have the opportunities to go to parks. And parks can be a great place for trees, for green infrastructure, and for people at the same time. And for the economy, you know, when you're talking to your elected officials, your decision makers, um, look at these two different outdoor dining restaurant options. The top one totally is, is more appealing where you have the trees, the natural greenery, the different colors of the vegetation. We know that having more green infrastructure and trees increases property values um, in urban areas. But you, there's a caveat, you have to be careful, right? Everything, you have to think about unintended consequences. You don't want property values to go up so much that it, it exacerbates displacement where people can no longer afford their property taxes, afford to live there, gentrification happens, they get forced out. So property value increase can be a good thing, but you have to have to be, you know, be wary of it. But increased business activity, we know that people will spend 10% more. They'll have 10% higher revenues in businesses that have green around them, trees, green infrastructure, et cetera, versus those that don't. And for governments, um, interestingly, conversations with groups like, uh, FEMA and, and other agencies like that, Homeland Security, discussions of if you go to the White House previously, several years ago, when you could go and walk closer, these barriers that were out there so a car can't come and drive through. And remember a couple of years ago, there was those sad stories of somebody renting a truck and driving through sidewalks and killing people in London and Times Square. Um, and so these barriers are up like that. And there's discussions of you can have similar barriers by having mature trees in some of these same areas. Somebody can't drive a car through a mature oak or elm tree. Um, and it also provides shades to tourists and people there. You know, um, we're seeing 
anecdotally, teachers are saying, yeah, recess time, we have, we let all the kids out and they all go and congregate around one place on the playground and we don't know why. And then you go and see, it's the only mature tree. It's the only shade in the playground. So of course all the kids go there and leave everywhere else because it's the only place to get any respite. And it also, it can also save money. Uh, it can be cheaper. It depends sometimes, but it can be cheaper to do green infrastructure um, and to plant trees. And there's cost savings in the long term in terms of the energy savings, the human health savings, um, the maintenance savings for doing green infrastructure and trees as well in a city. Some of the benefits of green infrastructure over traditional gray. Now, again, sometimes you need traditional gray, but green infrastructure starts working right away, right? That that tunnel I showed you, you can't start putting stormwater into that tunnel until it's completely done. You can't say, oh, it's halfway dug, we're gonna start putting water down there. No, you have to wait the full three to five years of the project. With green infrastructure, you do one rain garden, it starts working right away while you're starting to work on the other one. The trees, the plants, the soil are already there. You don't have to wait all those years. And green infrastructure appreciates the plants grow, they get hardier, they get stronger, the trees grow, they appreciate in value when you plant them versus depreciating like some gray infrastructure that you put in. Now you have to have ongoing maintenance though for that appreciation to happen. That creates ongoing jobs locally, but making sure that you maintain it's sexy to build and to do the capital costs and to plant trees and oftentimes that happens, but you have to make sure you have a maintenance plan so that the, the community likes how it looks aesthetically and that it functions the way it's supposed to. Life cycle, life cycle planning is critical. Like I said, maintenance planning, doing mapping up front to know where are the best places you wanna do your green infrastructure and tree canopy, looking at environmental as well as social equity data. Um, I mentioned O&M, community input. Uh, getting, doing charrettes, getting people bought in before you do something. You know, there's stories of best of efforts, best intentions, going in and planting trees in certain neighborhoods <clears throat> in DC. And uh, a bunch of community members came out and cut all the trees down. Why? It was an African-American community and a bunch of well-intentioned white environmentalists came into their community and started planting trees without engaging or asking them. They didn't want those trees there. They thought this was the first step of gentrification and of being displaced and pushed out. It's important to make sure you engage the local communities to make sure that they steward um, your, your projects and that there will be acceptance of it for the long term. And making sure we use a variety of resilient species. Um, we're talking a lot about shade and stormwater and the type of trees you use for that is very different when you're talking about urban air quality. You know, those are usually your um, your pines and your conifers versus your broadleaf trees for your stormwater and shade. And so you don't want to do too much of one and then 20 years look back, oh man, I wish that we'd had more of a variety of the different types of green infrastructure we used. And we're seeing that now um, where a lot of cities are looking at their ash trees and the emerald ash borer is, is killing them off and 30, 40% of their trees mature trees are ash that they planted 40, 50 years ago. And so they're in, in a race against time to try and replenish and replace those with new species of trees um, to help make sure that they don't lose all their urban tree canopy. Um, and, and resiliency, climate resiliency, it's a big thing. We've talked about flooding, heat, water pollution, habitat. But a couple of things I just want to leave you to think about is the security, we talked about you know, national security, violence, attacks, but also resiliency is some things that aren't environmental like uh, security to cyber attacks and threats, economy, affordability. Uh, you know, we're talking a lot about how do we make the city greener, but we also have to look at how are we making sure we're not losing populations of people that can't afford to live here anymore. And then the human health, how do we make sure that um, when we have things like what's happening in Texas, that we have resilience built in to be able to deal with that because um, it's going to be happening in other places and other municipalities all over the country. And so this slide just kind of is a slide we have. I can share that TNC slide that uh, captures a little bit of what I was saying. I guess I could have put this up and shared this with you and you could have been saved 20 minutes of hearing me drone on. Um, 
but just as a reminder of all the different great things that green infrastructure and trees um, and nature does for people in cities, the benefit it provides. I don't know much about the Del Marva. I love going there to visit, um, but I do think there's a lot of transferable lessons learned and um, natural assets that you can get from doing similar type strategies in your cities and, and urban areas. Thanks for hearing me out. Yeah, thank you, Khalil. Um, we've got time for one quick question. So if anybody has any that they'd like to ask, go ahead. In the meantime, I have one here um, that was asked earlier, but we skipped over it. Um, so what what's next and how do we inspire the next generation um, to take on these issues? Wow, the next generation, huh? I mean, I guess. <laughs> It's tough. I mean, you really have to have to go to them and speak to them. You know, one of the big things, that's why urban conservation is so important. More and more people are moving to cities. We're in the midst of the largest human migration in the history of the planet. And a lot of our uh, conservation groups have seven, eight, nine, ten decades of a great business model that is perfectly equipped for a world that no longer exists. All right, let's look at nature far away. Let's get the you know people excited who grew up going in their station wagons, the national parks and the nature, and that's important. But so many people, young people are living in urban areas, young professionals. And so many of them, I think someone mentioned earlier, right now during the pandemic, we're going to those natural areas. We're getting involved, they're getting interested. And I think we have this uh, unique opportunity to leverage that and to get young people interested in how did that get there? What's the benefits it provides? How can you get involved in making sure that it gets protected and then making sure that there's more of those put in your city? Um, one of the things that we're doing is we do some training with young people on advocacy, strategic advocacy. Advocacy, you know, Colin mentioned going on the hill. Advocacy isn't just, I care about this and I'm pounding my fist on the dais on the day of public comment or whatever. No, that you have to think of what are your talking points? Who are your allies? Who are your opponents? How am I going to get my message across? Researching who I'm meeting with. What do they care about? How can I make it fit? What's the story that's genuine for me and personal that they can attach to and not just the stats and the facts? Uh, and, and we're doing that and then taking young people out to Capitol Hill or their local city council so they get that experience. And it's, it's really amazing and inspirational to see these young people who are high school age at age 16 and 17 who are nervous and scared to meet with a member of Congress, this was pre-pandemic. And then after they do one or two, they say, wow, I didn't know that I had that right, that they have to listen to me, that I, I'm, I can go there and speak to them. I wanna do more of this, I wanna get involved. Um, I don't think that is just boring. I, I see how policy works and how it affects with me. So creating those opportunities, carving some space, sharing the wealth um, so that young people and that other communities that aren't traditionally involved in this, have some have a, a seat, not just at the table, um, but have a voice at, at what's going on. Yeah, thank you. As someone who has been on some of those trips, not with TNC, but through school and other means, it's definitely had a big impact on me. Um, so yeah, I, I connect with what you said and, and thanks everyone for listening in. I'm gonna transition over to Jim for some closing remarks and we'll wrap it up for the evening. Thanks everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Tyler. Um, and I, huge, huge thanks to our incredible uh, panel of speakers this evening. Um, Colin, Jessica, Katie, Khalil, you guys have all been fantastic. There's so much knowledge and experience and brilliant ideas uh, for us to explore here on the Delmarva Peninsula. Um, I really, really appreciate everybody's uh, time and attention this evening. Um, there were, you know, we, we promised to wrap up with takeaways uh, for, for each workshop. Um, I've got four takeaways uh, that I noted that I wanna share with everybody. Um, so first is because of COVID, uh, we're more connected to nature uh, than we've been in a long time and we need to keep it up. Uh, because of climate change, because of uh, changes within our environment, we need to keep it up. Um, there, uh, second is massive funding is gonna be required uh, for this type of natural protection. And so in, able, in order to, to make this a reality, uh, we've got to get creative with our funding solutions. Number three is there are numerous opportunities for citizens and NGOs to engage in policy 
and then project development. Um, there, there are so many great opportunities for us uh, collectively or just individually to get involved in the process in our own backyards. Uh, I think it's really exciting to think about the ways that we as individuals can make a difference. And finally, um, you know, piggybacking on Khalil's presentation, we, we need to embrace nature in all of its settings, not just in rural environments, but urban, suburban. Uh, we need to embrace uh, nature and, and its benefits and the solutions that it provides uh, wherever, we can, wherever we can make that happen. Um, and finally, before we cut everybody loose this evening, I'm gonna share just uh, one more slide with everybody. Uh, this is a save the date for workshop number four. Um, three weeks from today, March 16th, is our final workshop of the series. Uh, we're going to be talking about how you can make an impact in your community. Uh, so some of the lessons that we've learned this evening and throughout the, throughout the series, uh, we're going to apply to real actual, uh, not actual, but you know, real action that we can all be taking. Uh, to make a difference in our in our communities. And we've had so many good questions that are posed to our speakers throughout the entire workshop series that we haven't been able to get to. We want to create an opportunity to foster more dialogue with our speakers. So we've invited all of the workshop speakers to come back on March 30th, uh, same time frame, 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, we're going to do a little uh, round table, a happy hour forum. It's all going to be question and answer. It's all going to be just dialogue and going around the horn and sharing some ideas. Um, I think it's going to be really exciting. And I think that we're going to really, really dive into some, some uh, good rabbit holes, so to speak. Uh, so I hope that everybody will be able to join us for that as well. Look for more details in your uh, email inbox shortly. Um, as a reminder, this will be posted to Eastern Shoreland Conservancy's uh, website and Facebook page, our YouTube channel. Uh, so please uh, spread the news far and wide of this workshop series. I hope that we'll be able to uh, get some more people who catch it later on after it's recorded. Thank you again to all of our speakers tonight. Thank you again to the Rash Foundation for making all of this possible. Thank you, Tyler, for your help with logistics and Q&A. I hope everybody has enjoyed it. I know, I, ha I know that I have. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.